Technology is changing absolutely every element of our lives. So it goes without saying that the way we live and the places that we live are going to be impacted by technology as well. This is why I'm here at the AT&T Summit to find out what a smart city is going to look like, not in the future, but today. Check it out. Mike Zito, I'm the General Manager and Executive Director of at and Smart Cities Business Globally, and we're here at the 2017 at and Summit. The smart cities, technology, we think flying cars when we think about smart cities, but there's got to be building blocks, obviously, beforehand to get to us when a city is actually smart. Sure. Yeah. What's at and doing in the space? So, so I think you're right. I don't know that we're going to get to flying cars anytime soon, uh, but smart cities is certainly, it's an evolution, not a revolution, and it's a journey. And we've been on it for a while as a, as a society. Uh, if you look at smart cities from a, uh, a, just a timeline perspective, the term smart cities has been around for 10 or 15 years, right? Um, and, and what I would say is there's a smart cities 1.0, a smart cities 2.0, and a smart cities 3.0. Smart cities 1.0 was the first 10 to 12 years uh, and was really about city hall procuring in a traditional manner, uh, deploying technology in silos, and not really leveraging the full benefit that the Internet of Things and a strategy uh, associated with Internet of Things technology can really drive. Smart Cities 2.0, which is, let's say, two years ago to 10 years from now, um, is really giving you the opportunity to engage the citizens in the decision-making process as to what problems the city needs to solve on their behalf. Uh, it's engaging the tech ecosystem and driving economic development and innovation. It's engaging large companies like AT&T and then the utilities all coming to work together to give the city uh, the data that they need to go from being uh, reactive to being proactive. And then Smart Cities 3.0 is not quite flying cars, but that's when you're going to get the autonomous and you're going to get the drones. And a lot of that is being driven not just by technology, because we know the technology is there. It's being driven by policy, right? And so that's that 2025 and beyond. Uh, and the policies have to catch up to allow the technology, right, to be scaled. So what we're doing here at AT&T is we were the, the first carrier to stand up a dedicated smart cities business a little over two years ago. The first thing we recognized was that um, cities have silos and the regional ecosystem around those cities is just as important uh, to get engaged as the individual silos within the city. And so we stood up the AT&T Smart Cities framework in essence to uh, help break down those silos, provide best practices, and then provide multiple types of connectivity solutions, uh, bring in multiple uh, partners to help drive the value because in IoT, no one, no one company does it all. It's an ecosystem play. Um, build out end-to-end -end solutions and offerings that help drive value uh, and then focus on really five key solution domains. So focus on energy and utilities and building solutions and strategies that drive value there. Public safety, right, which is first and foremost on every mayor's mind and frankly citizens, um, infrastructure, which can include solutions for roads and bridges and monitoring uh, roads and bridges and the health of them. Uh, you've also got uh, citizen engagement, so think uh, public Wi-Fi uh, and equitable distribution of assets while keeping citizens engaged in the process, and then uh, you're going to have uh, traffic and transportation. So traffic and transportation, obviously, uh, you if you can decrease traffic, uh, you're giving people time back in their day. Uh, you're creating a more livable uh, environment for them uh, and obviously decreasing uh, emissions and providing a lot of good for the environment as well. So that's where we started. Uh, and then we wanted to prove out um, uh, a hypothesis we had around 
uh, deploying multiple solutions in one area of the city and aggregating that data up would allow a city to have better insight into what's happening and then make decisions and again be more proactive versus reactive. And so we announced uh, that we were going to bring some cities into a Spotlight City program um, and we actually expanded that from just cities to counties and to campuses as well. And so Dallas, Atlanta, Chicago, Miami-Dade um, and a few others we brought into this program and have deployed multiple uh, solutions in one to two areas of that city and now we're starting to see the results of that and the benefits that are being driven. When we break all these components down, it boils down to data and being able to have information and not siloed information, but information that can be applicable kind of across the board, across different departments. Yep. Uh, are we going to go toward more of an e-government because all these components are going to start plugging in? Yeah, so interoperability is key, right, to making this all work. So, so we have uh, focused on a couple of things. One, one of the things that, that you mentioned, data. Um, there's a, a data uh, democratization process, if you will. Uh, and, and again, uh, I don't know how often that term is used, but you know, the citizens own the data, the city owns the data that's generated from all these IoT connected devices, right? Um, and the only way that you're really gonna drive value from that data is by uh, aggregating it across the different silos. One of the things that we've done is created a solution called Smart Cities Operation Center. It's in essence, uh, gives the mayor or the CIO or council, depending on what you know, country you're in, uh, the ability to uh, see in multiple silos what's happening across the city in one dashboard. And in Miami-Dade County, they actually have eight different functions up on a wall uh, on eight different screens. And the mayor of Miami-Dade County, Mayor Jimenez, comes in every Monday morning and sees all that data aggregated up with his 40 leads of the departments, including PD, 311, uh, ports, the airport, and understands what's happening uh, every day. And so that's that data being bubbled up. And then the next piece of that is once you've got the data into something that city leadership uh, can make decisions around, uh, you can then open that data up to the public. And that's that data democratization that you're talking about, right? Where you have the opportunity to allow entrepreneurs to take the data and build apps that could potentially drive job growth and GDP into the region. You have the ability for that entrepreneur to create an app that allows a citizen to get uh, the pollen count at the park nearest to their house before they walk out the door uh, with their child that may have asthma. And the way you're gathering that data, that pollen count, is from solutions like AT&T's digital infrastructure that are sensor nodes that are deployed on light fixtures with cameras and environmental sensors and, uh, and audio sensors uh, built into one device that has a set of applications that sits on top of it, almost think of it as a smartphone for municipalities, and then that data can be taken and put into something that a citizen can engage with, right? So whether they're using the data to build a business or whether they're using the data to improve their quality of life and the livability around them in the city, that's the opportunity for open data and that data democratization and aggregation of that anonymous data up into one place. And you mentioned the word anonymous because there's a big security concern. What do we do about citizens who are say, well, I don't want to be tracked. I don't want my face, facial recognitions and pop up on every security camera under the sun. Well, how do we address security concern? So public safety is obviously first and foremost, as I said, on every mayor's mind. Um, and, and you've got to have privacy policies in place. Cities do, right? AT&T does. And any of the data that, that, that we have is aggregated and anonymous. And we don't use data unless somebody opts in you know, for us to be able to use that data about a person. When you look at all the cameras and, and the different center node solutions that have cameras and, and the way cities are looking at it, um, you know, tie it back to technology and edge compute and edge processing. What's happening is the image of that person is not going back to the city, right? The metadata is. So it's a person right, that is at an intersection. It's not Mike's face at the intersection. But the cities are now starting to employ two security officers right, in, in the United States and, and across other parts of the world too. So that's, that's a really good step in the right direction for states, cities, municipalities. Right? It's, it's, you've got somebody there that understands cyber, uh, that probably came from private industry or came from military, and they are there to uh, oversee those programs for the city. Uh, they're starting to get access to resources 
Uh, some are full-time employees that work for the city, and then some are the AT&Ts of the world that have a very strong background in protecting uh, networks, right? And, and so for us, uh, at at and the way we're providing value to the cities is bringing that 100 plus years of expertise of providing uh, network security uh, options for our customers, right? And securing our own network. So we started the device layer and make sure that the devices are secured and certified. Uh, then we go to the network layer, which again is something we've been doing forever. Uh, and then to the cloud layer with offerings we have like NetOne um, or cloud security offerings. And then we've got a 24 by 7, 365 threat analysis layer uh, and team that's constantly looking uh, in, in detecting um, if there are threats, who the bad actors are, et cetera, et cetera. And then providing that back to the city. So we can provide that service to the city uh, as AT&T to a chief security officer so they don't need to employ all those resources or build that skill set up. And so that's what we're starting to see as a tremendous value add uh, working with an AT&T in the cities because of situations like you just mentioned. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. And there you have it. at and is making sure that the cities of the future are able to handle the ever-growing population that doesn't seem to be leaving the big metropolitan cities. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Talking Tech with a Techie Guy. I'll see you on the next episode. Smash that subscribe button if you're new here. I'll see you guys soon. Cheers for now.